return to part one. Part one. You hear an interview conversation between a banker and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully, and answer the questions one to seven. Hi, can I open a bank account, please? Sure, come on in. Make yourself at home. I'll just get some details for you. It won't take long. Okay, right. What kind of account do you want? A deposit account. Okay, I've got the application form here. Then have a look at this leaflet. We have several types. I've decided on the one called Classic. Good, that's fine. Can I have your full name, please? Yes, it's Jonathan Fox. That's J O N A T H A N. Oh right, thank you. And what's your date of birth, please? The twenty-first of January, nineteen seventy. Right. Do you have another bank account in the UK? No, not yet. This is the first one. Okay, fine. And what is your address in the UK, sir? Ten, Island House, South Key. That's East London, isn't it? Yes. Near Canary Wharf, right? Yes, that's right. How long have you been at your current address? Ah.、Uh, Just around one month, actually. Okay, that's fine. Can I ask for a previous address? Sure. It's flat three, Canada House, Queen Street. Is that all? Yes. That's Edinburgh, isn't it? Yes. Edinburgh. Okay. Thank you. Do you have a daytime telephone or mobile phone number? Yes. I think the number of my office. It's zero two zero seven two three five six seven three five. Would you like my home phone number too? Yes, please. It's o two o four six seven five one two two two. Lovely. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at the questions eight to ten. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Right. What do you do for a living in the UK, sir? I am working at an English language school in central London as a tutor. It's my main job. Okay. Now we usually ask for a piece of information for checking your identity for security reasons. If you phone us. Sure. What name is your mother's first name? Because it's less likely to be known. Okay, it's Monica. Thank you. Yes, M O N I C A. It's Russian. Okay, good. And how much would you like to open your account with? I've only brought one thousand pounds. Okay, fine. How often would you like to receive bank statements? I won't be needing bank statements. What about an online banking service? Okay, just a moment, please. Can I check in the box on the screen? Sure. I was also wondering about a mortgage service. Sure. Can you just wait a moment? I'll introduce you to a mortgage marketing manager. Thank you.
That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You'll hear a tourism programme, The Elizabeth House. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer the questions 11 to 14. Hi everybody, good to see you again. This morning I'll tell you about the Elizabeth House in Canterbury, once home of the famous carpenter Jonathan Owen. He bought the house in 1965, although he had first seen it five years earlier. Actually, he was interested in the house as a traditional flat in England, and he paid £5,000 for it without a second thought, because of it having standard and regulation building methods during the Middle Ages in the UK. At that time, he had worked at the University of Canterbury as a head carpenter, who managed with a small building company. His professional success was abundant, but his family life wasn't so successful. His parents had suffered from diabetes and mental disease and his brother Dan was ill with pneumonia. Moving to Elizabeth's house, he started his new life. Jonathan considered the home a pure example of traditional East England country house and did some of his successful building structure work here. The backyard and garden of the house became calm and peaceful. The materials used to make the wall, chimney and roof were collected from the local area. Most of all, oak trees were in the front of the main gate. Before you hear the rest of the programme, you have some time to look at the questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. As you go up the path, there's the rose garden on your right and you will find to your left an area which has interesting types of sunflower as well as some lovely carnation. It is known as the Sun Rainbow and was designed by his brother Dan who had studied gardening arts in Paris. The next destination is the Japanese footbridge with exotic Asian mountain plants and fruit growing on it. Follow the path round to the second corner and on your left you will see the entrance to the pear tree with its 200 year old branches go through the path until you've reached the front of the house. Now I'll give you a couple of hours to wander around this lovely building. Your tour guide will introduce and explain about its history and viewpoints to you. 
If you need to buy any of Jonathan's handbooks or other souvenirs, you can enter the house where you'll find the shop, which is located between the path and the water mill. I expect by this time you may also be in need of a rest and some refreshments from the snack bar. If you have a break, there is a lovely walk down towards the river Cotton. This is the best view for visitors. You can cross the field which spreads along the path close to the windmill. In autumn, this area will open a small event or festival which is definitely worth a visit. It is familiar a good place for growing strawberries. Every season, most of the residents are ready to make local produce. Also, the local council helps to improve the grape festival by promoting and marketing it through online and offline methods. Last year, around 100 tons of grapes were harvested and sold at the city mall. We'll now have a good chance to see an orchard behind the house. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You'll hear a conversation between students, Anne and David, about gallery marketing. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer the questions 21 to 24. Anne, we really need to get working on this gallery marketing assignment. We've only got two weeks left until the end of the month to set up. Right, so how about getting started now? We need to work through the instructions. Well, we must search for one area from tourism industries, like the museum or gallery. There are lots of sites online. What are they about? The National Science Museum, the History Museum, the War Museum, the Tate Modern Art Gallery and so on. You got more? We've got plenty. I've got an idea to find out the best comment. Coming this Friday, we'll get more information at the London Museum because it shows all the visitors' guidebooks of museums or galleries in the UK. It also runs a small workshop about non-profit tourism industries marketing. Great. So after visiting there, we have to use research methods, such as telephone interviews, questionnaires on the street or sending out emails. Actually, we don't have a choice. We have to send the email. Right. We don't have to waste time deciding among them. By the way... How do we get the responses? Um, let's contact the London Museum's Information Centre. Actually, it may be helpful to us to collect data through our head course leader. How many people do we have to interview? Well, we have to split into three groups. And it looks like we have to interview 30 people for each group. So, 90 altogether then. It depends on the ages too, right? That's right. So, are they all the requirements? Yes, looks like it. Hmm. Firstly, which part are we going to choose? My preference would be a modern art gallery, since that's where I spend most of the time. I think you've got something wrong. I don't think there are abundant differences in the exhibitions there. 
I mean you get young and old, man and woman, amateur and professional, all going to the galleries. Right. So let's make it a ceramic exhibition then. So basically, what two groups will we compare and contrast for that? Male and female? Absolutely. Also, most of my respondents like the same ceramics as me. Also, I think different age groups could be changed to highlight differences. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at the questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I think you're right. I'll take some comment. The age groups are teenagers, 20s, 30s, 40s and over. What do you think about this? Great. That will give us more detail. So how about the kind of ceramic they like? Let's give them some options and then we can just tick boxes. OK. Let's have Asian, European, African. What else? Something special? Well, we should include the Incas in Peru. Some people like this style, you know. OK. And then we should know about their understanding of ceramics. They can learn about that thanks to a gallery curator who can inform them about the patterns and markings through picture and local clay. I'm curious about how they were made. I mean a process with painting and things embedded on the surface. At that time, the equipment and materials were not good, compared with the present day. I agree. We should also include an earthen vessel, of course. Right. The next step could be about where they were actually from. They were made from local clay, weren't they? Things such as mountain, lake, basement and so forth. I think so. One more thing is the colour on the bottle. How did the ancients get the tone? On the internet, it said they got it through dried plants. They were working again to make a tone, drying and sorting. OK, I see. To get more hard tone, they included other strong herbs or something. At that time, the colours were used by the rich with property. Great. You've got plenty of data, David. No, no. It's just beginning. We have to look for something special with more details and history for the presentation next week. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You'll hear part of a lecture given by a waste recycle management's professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer the questions 31 to 40. Hi everyone. This morning I'm going to talk to you about flea markets in England. 
At first, we were surprised to learn that only fifteen percent of people here in England make an effort to collect waste. That is lower than other European countries. Also, it might be falling within a couple of years' time, unless the government makes a severe regulation for industries and local residences. The UK government's target means that by 2012, we must decrease our waste emissions by 45 percent compared with 2000. Local councils can offer support to meet that target. By taking part in the national green campaign, and investing in local flea markets. Most of all, these markets reduce waste emissions from landfill sites. A flea market or swap meet is a type of bazaar, where very cheap or second-hand goods are sold or bartered for. It may be indoors, like in a warehouse or school gymnasium. Or it may be outdoors, like in a field or under a tent. The flea market vendors display the goods used on the table for selling, such as a few unwanted household items to operate commerce, including a variety of used living products. Many flea markets in European countries have food vendors who sell snacks and drinks to the visitors. And may be part of a small event such as carnivals or concerts. As part of our research, our team carried out a questionnaire with people in the local area. The results said, "We need to open more second-hand shops." However, one problem is that there is a lack of information and marketing. To solve the problems. Local councils should invest and support in flea markets by doing things like creating parking space, organizing security, public promotions using the internet, and other resources. We were also surprised to discover how waste such as furniture, computers, kitchen tools, and other such things are reused, and wooden furniture. Or electronic products are easy to recycle because they can be reused over and over again without becoming weaker. Around three million electronic goods are thrown away per year. Also, around five hundred thousand pieces of furniture are also disposed of. Only one fifth is collected, and fortunately recycled through many local flea markets. In 2009, there were around 3,000 flea markets in England. The number is increasing, steadily, so far. Surprisingly, by collecting under 15% of old books, lots of paper is imported, so more paper can be recycled in the UK. Europe recycles 50% of its paper. And Germany recycles eighty percent of its paper. When recycling launched, there were quality problems, so it was so hard to reuse paper in office sheets. However, these problems have now been solved, and Union of the Flea Markets, based in East London, produces high-quality recycled paper. Another union, Loving Paper. Currently sells the paper that has been through a sorting process to farmers or gardeners as fertilizer. So to sum up, there seems to be a number of activities that enable people to reuse waste, but the substantial problem is encouraging people to think twice about taking their waste to a flea market instead of throwing it away. I think the recycling program. Will make us save materials, and protect the environment in future. And next, I'll show the plan for promoting it. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test. 
you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. All right, folks. So you're aiming for an 8.5 in ILTS reading? That sounds like a tall order, but I've got you covered. Today, I'll share some proven strategies to help you ace that reading section. First up, practice makes perfect. You need to get your hands on as many ILTS reading practice tests as possible. The more you read, the more familiar you'll become with the types of questions and the structure of the passages. Make it a daily habit. Next, Work on your time management. You've got 60 minutes to answer 40 questions. That's not a lot of time, so you need to be efficient. I recommend spending no more than 20 minutes per passage. Use a timer while practicing to get a real feel for the time pressure. Now let's talk about skimming and scanning. These are your best friends in the ILTS reading test. Skimming means quickly going through the passage to get the main idea and scanning is about looking for specific information. You don't need to read every word. Trust me, this saves a ton of time. Another tip, pay attention to keywords. When you read the questions, underline or highlight the keywords. These will guide you to the relevant parts of the passage. It's like having a map in a treasure hunt. All right, now for a big one. Practice different question types. The ILTS reading section includes multiple choice true slash false slash not given, matching headings, and more. Make sure you understand the strategies for each type. For example, with true slash, false slash, not given questions, don't assume anything. Stick to what the passage actually says. Vocabulary is key, too. You don't need to know every word, but having a strong vocabulary helps you understand the passages better. Read widely from different sources like newspapers, journals, and books. Build your vocabulary by learning a few new words every day and using them in sentences. One more thing, stay calm and focused. It's easy to get overwhelmed, but keep your cool. If a question seems tough, move on and come back to it later if you have time. Sometimes, other questions can provide clues that help you with the tough ones. Finally, review your answers if you have time left. Look for any silly mistakes or questions you might have skipped. Every point counts, and there you have it. Follow these strategies, and you'll be well on your way to scoring that 8.5 in IELTS reading. Remember, it's all about practice, strategy, and staying calm under pressure. Good luck, and smash that reading test. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more tips on acing your IELTS. Thanks for watching.